Hi, this is John Romano, and I'm recording this lecture, New Contacts, for my course, World Civilization 2, 1500. And this lecture, uh, the last one in the course, uh, is intended to wrap up the very new kind of contacts that take place in a very broad period of time, from around the year 1300 to a, around the year 1800. Uh, and in fact, the contacts in this long period take many different forms, uh, but uh, the first one that I'll start with uh, is on missionary work. And in particular, uh, the a new form of uh, Muslim missionaries begins to strike out in the world. Um, a, uh, uh, a group known as Sufis, uh, and uh, the new form of Muslim devotion that they practice is known as Sufism. The term Sufi itself um, derives from the, the sort of um, patched uh, woolen garments uh, that uh, members of uh, this group tended to favor. Uh, and um, Sufis themselves were people uh, who um, did not in any way deny Muslim teachings. Um, many of the members of this group are people who had advanced degree in Muslim theology and law. Uh, so they were, in many cases, uh, really quite learned. Um, and uh, for the most part, uh, they tended uh, to lead pious, ascetic lives. Uh, and um, really, the Sufis as a whole, uh, as a group, tended to be very devoted to the needs of the poor, which of course is that all Muslims were supposed to do, but um, the Sufis really went out of their way uh, to exemplify that virtue. Uh, we think, uh, here's just one uh, manuscript written by a Sufi. Sufis believed that uh, one could um, find a kind of mystical, ecstatic union with God, with Allah. Uh, and um, they attempted to, uh, to find this form of mystical union uh, through means, uh, like, for instance, uh, sermons, uh, passionate singing, uh, dancing. All of this, uh, they felt, would bring them to a state of high emotion uh, that would bring them ultimately closer to God. All of um, this, this uh, sort of strain of thought within Islam, um, th this idea, for instance, uh, that one could actually, for instance, sing and dance and get closer to God uh, was something that uh, uh, for many uh, conservative Muslim theologians was not something that one could, abs uh, could actually do. And uh, the fear emerged that um, in the course of their uh, very passionate uh, devotions, uh, these people could theoretically stray into heresy and not care about doctrine as much uh, as, uh, as union with God. Nevertheless, in spite of um, the reservations that a, a small minority of people within the Muslim community had about these people, we do think that Sufis became very popular in the Muslim world. And uh, the reason I'm talking about them here is not for their own sake, but the fact that they went on to become very important missionaries are some of the best, uh, the best carriers of the message of Islam during this long period. And uh, we think that um, one of the reasons why Sufis were so, were so good at uh, carrying the message of Islam is because they really uh, emphasized above all else that you had to be devoted to God. Uh, and in fact, that kind of um, straightforward love was far more important than learning uh, all of um, the complicated teaching of Islam. Uh, and uh, really, in some ways, um, these missionaries would actually tolerate people uh, revering Allah in ways that um, would, would never have uh, been allowed in more conservative Muslim areas, more traditionally Muslim areas. Uh, so in some cases, allowing people to um, to continue to practice pre-Muslim uh, religious practices, but now saying that they were being done uh, for the purposes of honoring Allah. 
Uh, and uh, we see through this process that substantial Muslim communities begin to emerge in India. And uh, there are many reasons uh, why um, the uh, in India some people chose to, to found uh, really find uh, Islam as an attractive religion. Uh, if you were a low caste uh, Hindu and you had no opportunity in this life to uh, advance your position, you would understand uh, that in Islam everyone was equal. Uh, we also think some Buddhists who were disillusioned by the difficulty of achieving nirvana uh, must have found that there was a, a much easier path to understand to be able to be a good Muslim. Uh, on top of that, we think that um, India really embraces Sufis in part because um, India had really always valued men uh, who um, were uh, trying to seek some sort of mystical union with God or gods. Uh, and uh, who were detached from everyday mundane affairs. Uh, so Sufis really uh, suited that very well. Uh, and uh, bear in mind altogether that we think that um, uh, Muslims were never uh, more than maybe around 20% of the overall population, and um, really they were concentrated in the northern part of India. Um, the cultures uh, to the southern parts of India really were never seriously touched by Sufis or any other Muslim missionaries. Um, unlike so many other traditions, religious traditions that came to India, uh, that at one point would simply be absorbed into Hinduism, um, Islam really um, had such distinctive beliefs and practices uh, and uh, that it really could not simply be um, be consumed uh, by Hinduism. And so it actually uh, ends up uh, essentially forming uh, its own minority tradition within India. Um, and uh, really, um, many of those people would eventually uh, be concentrated in the northwest portion of India that uh, in the modern times would become known as Pakistan. Um, some of um, merchants who lived in, and other uh, scholars sometimes, in other cases Sufis, who lived in uh, India uh, would also uh, take journeys sometimes uh, into areas of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, especially those areas that are uh, today known uh, collectively as Indonesia. Uh, and uh, in effect, we actually begin to see um, the, the really a significant spread of Islam in these regions as well. And again, at least in part brought by Sufis. Within this broad period as well, we also begin to see uh, new Christian missionaries. Uh, one very interesting one pictured here in a late image is John of Monte Corvino. Um, John himself was Italian, and as you can see by the image, a Franciscan. Uh, who ends up traveling uh, to Southeast Asia as a representative of the Pope. Um, and uh, he actually ends up becoming uh, the Archbishop in, uh, in Beijing. And there he worked to try his best to establish Christianity. Uh, for instance, um, uh, doing translation work on the New Testament and the Psalms. Uh, and uh, he also has several churches built in China. Uh, John will baptize uh, young boys, uh, both from uh, Mongol families and then Chinese families, um, and uh, he begins to teach them uh, the liturgy uh, of the Roman Catholic Church. Altogether, we do tend to think that John was popular and widely respected, uh, but uh, we really think that um, perhaps because of the wide divergence in religious traditions, uh, he ends up attracting very few Asian people uh, to Christianity, uh, and uh, really, um, he never received all that much in the way of resources uh, from Western Europe because he was so far afield from them. Um, we also um, see individual travelers uh, traveling uh, from east to west. Um, perhaps one of the most famous examples of this uh, is a man known as Ruban Sauma.
Ruban is a title that means master. Sauma is his proper name. Sauma was a Christian priest and monk, uh, although he was a group um, that was viewed as a uh, as heretical in Western Europe. Um, and uh, Sauma was actually of Turkish ancestry, uh, but he ends up actually, as so many foreign people, uh, becoming an employee of the Mongols. And he ends up traveling then to uh, Western Europe um, to be able to create an alliance uh, between Western Europeans and Mongols to converge on Muslims in the Middle East. And here's just one of the letters he carried with him uh, to that end. While Sauma was in Western Europe, he ends up meeting uh, with the Pope at the time. He also meets with the kings of both France and England. Um, and uh, uh, Sauma, unfortunately, um, he ends up actually failing in his diplomatic mission. Uh, there never ends up actually being an alliance between Western Europeans uh, and Mongols, uh, but um, we we do have Sauma's uh, travelogue that he composed about his travels, uh, and uh, uh, he has all sorts of interesting observations about Western Europe. About, for instance, uh, that uh, they, unlike he was accustomed to uh, among the Mongols, it appears that uh, warriors in Western Europe did not actually end up attacking civilians, which he was very impressed by. Uh, he also visits Paris, and he sees their a wonderful university there. He's just surprised about how many people are studying there, which is really very uh, different from anything he was accustomed to. Sauma would end up attending papal liturgies during Holy Week uh, and uh, visiting all kinds of Roman churches and venerating relics while he was in Rome. Another important uh, individual traveler, and perhaps for some the greatest medieval traveler was this man here, known as Marco Polo. Uh, Marco Polo would come from a family of merchants um, who took advantage of the period in which Mongols um, really made the Silk Road a safe place to travel, uh, and he and his family would go through these territories um, and uh, trade uh, further in the east uh, in Mongol areas. Uh, and uh, while he was in the Mongol court, it appears uh, that the Khan at the time, the leader of the Mongols, took a liking to, to Marco. Um, Marco supposedly was known to be a great conversationalist, uh, master of many languages, uh, and a great storyteller, too. Uh, and uh, it appears that uh, Marco Polo would receive a minor position as a governor uh, for the Mongols, uh, and he would actually end up taking uh, diplomatic missions on behalf of the Mongols as well. And uh, Polo would end up actually spending altogether around 17 years in China before uh, finally deciding to return home. Uh, and uh, it really, um, when he begins to set down uh, his, uh, uh, his tales in writing, uh, we think the person he collaborated with uh, really ends up exaggerating many of his stories considerably um, and uh, t uh, telling about the, the so-called uh, exotic uh, East. Another important uh, individual traveler is a man known as Ibn Battuta. Um, and I've told you that um, there were certainly many uh, Muslim merchants and um, just mer Muslim travelers generally. Uh, although many of uh, them did not write any um, tales about their journeys, or in other cases, um, we simply have lost any of their tales. Not so with Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta was a Muslim who came from Morocco and writes one of the great works of travel literature that we have. Uh, and uh, perhaps more than anything else, what his work uh, demonstrates to us is how unified uh, the Muslim world was in the medieval period. And uh, although Ibn Battuta himself uh, is born in Morocco, he doesn't stay there for that long, uh, and he ends up actually crossing uh, nearly 75,000 miles uh, in his different journeys over a period of around 30 years. 
uh, going, for instance, to Spain, Asia Minor, uh, both West and East Africa, um, the Arabian Peninsula, Iraq, um, Iran, India, and China. Uh, and uh, we know that at, at certain times, um, Ibn Battuta would travel as a pilgrim, and in fact ends up making uh, the pilgrimage to Mecca twice in his lifetime, unusual for a Muslim. Uh, he ends up becoming very interested uh, in his course of his travels in Sufi ideas, um, and uh, he actually um, himself, he had done tra training as a legal scholar. And in fact, um, the, uh, uh, the the Muslim world and uh, the law that they created based upon the Quran was so similar uh, that someone who had uh, received his training um, in Morocco could actually serve as a judge, as he did in India, uh, as a, in a Muslim uh, Muslim court. Uh, and uh, along the way, too, Ibn Battuta ends up running into and traveling with many Muslim merchants, um, in part just for safety. Almost all of Ibn Battuta's travels occur uh, within Muslim regions, uh, and really he moves among people who share the same faith, the same language, and the same laws. Um, if there is anything that ends up shocking Ibn Battuta along his travels, uh, is that um, he found out not all Muslim areas behave the same way. And uh, he himself had come from a well-established Muslim region, uh, but um, he was shocked to learn in, in some of the areas uh, that he traveled that uh, were Muslim too. Uh, women, for instance, had a lot more freedom than he was used to seeing them have. Um, he even saw Muslims, for instance, who did things like drink wine, which technically speaking, they were not supposed to. Perhaps the area that for Ibn Battuta was most foreign uh, was China. Um, and uh, it, he really uh, had a lot of trouble explaining how exactly the people in China could be so prosperous uh, because um, they weren't Muslim, they were pagan. Uh, and um, you know, God should not have showered uh, that amount of, uh, of blessings on people who, uh, who did not believe in him. All, while all of uh, these contacts are important, um, I would argue that the contacts, the new contacts uh, that are most important in this long period we're discussing, and the ones that are, in fact are going to uh, become, uh, really develop in the years after this course is finished, uh, are uh, ones in what is known as the age of discovery. And uh, from right around the year 1400 to right around the year 1800, Western European sailors are going to launch a remarkable series of exploratory voyages that will in time take them to all the waters of the earth. Um, these are very expensive altogether, uh, but they pay very large dividends. Um, in, in part, just an increase in knowledge, uh, if, if nothing else initially, of course, just a knowledge of the geography of the world. Um, but also, um, in time, Europeans are going to, uh, as a result of having uh, set out for the rest of the world, they're going to create a global network of communication, transport, and exchange. And, of course, they will handsomely benefit uh, materially uh, from all these efforts. So why was it that Europeans begin to set out um, and uh, really begin to explore during this period? Well, um, part of the story um, starts with a um, teeny little Portugal uh, right here. Um, we think that um, the Portuguese um, really go out and start exploring the world, uh, in case, some cases just for basic resources. Uh, they share the Iberian Peninsula with Spain, with whom they were often in bad, uh, in bad relations with, and they needed to be able then to get things like, for instance, uh, fish or timber uh, and sugar. 
Um, we also um, see that um, there is a lore of uh, many explorers to want to go to Asia um, to be able to get some of the same luxury goods uh, that previously um, they had gotten accustomed to getting. Um, in part through uh, the Silk Road, in part because they could go uh, to Constantinople, uh, the uh, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, and uh, once um, this Silk Road ends up becoming more dangerous, and once the Turks had conquered the Byzantine Empire, Western Europeans were no longer uh, really welcome in either place. And yet, Western Europeans still wanted some of the spices um, they had gotten before. Think about like pepper or ginger. Um, they wanted also uh, to get things uh, like gold, ivory, and slaves. And um, what this meant was they wanted to uh, get, uh, first of all, direct routes to Asia, but also direct routes um, to Africa as well. The other reason that Europeans want to explore is that they want to be able to uh, further their own missionary efforts um, and to further expand the boundaries of Christianity. Uh, now that most of Western Europe was Christian, um, they wanted to then um, to, to tap into this entirely new area and convert people. These motives were often um, combined and really they reinforce one another. Uh, and uh, you, you really will see on the same exact voyages uh, on which um, you see, for instance, a bunch of merchants going out, you'll also see missionaries in the form of uh, Franciscans or Dominicans uh, traveling with them, and sometimes uh, with very different goals, uh, and sometimes mutually uh, uh, really uh, uh, different, uh, different uh, conceptions of what one should be doing um, in the areas you found to start out with. Unlike elsewhere in the world, in Western Europe, um, all of this exploration and trading was supported by governments. Um, this is very different, for instance, from what we said with Imperial China, um, that in time had really just um, decided that it was going to cut itself off from large portions of the world. Now, the theory that would uh, develop uh, in Western Europe uh, was one of mercantilism. Um, and uh, really, this is an economic theory uh, that will end up uh, inspiring much of uh, this exploration and trade that Western Europeans uh, begin to go out on to do. The attitude uh, in this theory is that all nations want to attempt to maximize their profits. And uh, the way you know you've done this uh, is to get as much gold and silver as possible. Um, this theory also is uh, one in which you have to extract wealth from other places you go and take it back to the home country. Uh, there is no ideal in this uh, theory of um, everyone benefiting from trade. Um, only your home country really is supposed to make out well. Uh, and uh, so all of these different uh, Western European governments begin uh, to try their best to support um, these, uh, these people who are sailing out um, to be able to find new things to trade, uh, to create national monopolies, you know, to get in an area first, make sure you um, had a grip on all the goods. And it was a theory, obviously, that a sponsored competition, because you know, really there could only be one winner. Uh, and uh, some people would say, though, that uh, competition in this case really ends up making Western Europeans stronger. All of these little countries that set out um, have to get better or they'll get squeezed out of the game entirely. All of this um, exploration too uh, is allowed by a new technology 
uh, ships like this one, for instance, that had a rudder uh, that allowed people to maneuver them easily, and two sets of sails that then allowed them to take advantage of different winds. Western Europeans also had new navigational instruments. Um, especially important is the, what is featured here, the magnetic compass uh, that allowed, uh, allowed you to figure out uh, what direction you were heading. Uh, which is absolutely essential if you're going to take to the high seas where you can't see the land. Um, you need the compass to figure out where you're going. It is fair to say, too, um, that uh, Western Europeans in, in, toward, the, uh, toward the period around the 15th century begin to develop weapons that were more advanced than anywhere else. Um, they both managed to figure out how to make gunpowder uh, far deadlier than it had ever been, and they begin to experiment uh, with metal making uh, to create better, uh, better guns. Uh, and in fact, um, these weapons um, allowed them to dominate sometimes much larger native populations uh, who simply, of course, could not call upon uh, these, these uh, guns. Um, starting in the 15th century, we think uh, that the Portuguese uh, begin uh, to really invest a lot of money uh, in, uh, in exploration. And particularly this man here, known as Henry the Navigator, who was a, a royal prince in Portugal, who really inspires uh, his country to go uh, and to begin to seriously begin to start trading. Uh, down to the south. Uh, and uh, initially, um, they simply uh, conquered a port in Morocco. Uh, and then they began to slowly go down uh, the West, Europe, West African coast. Uh, for instance, establishing um, a fortified trading post in modern-day Ghana. Uh, and really, and uh, other strategic locations. The Portuguese would then exchange uh, European horses, leather, and uh, textiles uh, for, um, uh, for metal like gold and for slaves. After Henry's death, this process of uh, slowly creeping down um, the West African uh, coast uh, would, be, uh, would be capped off when finally uh, Western Europeans would manage to get all the way to the southernmost tip of Africa, known as the Cape of Good Hope, which in spite of its name is known to be a very treacherous place to navigate uh, for those uh, in ships. And uh, the reason why I'm mentioning to this is that once Western Europeans were, uh, were capable of doing that, of going uh, around Africa, what it me meant all of a sudden uh, was that both India and um, and East Asia were open to them. They could begin to go to these places directly. Um, and all of a sudden, you see Western Europeans uh, beginning to pop up uh, in all these places, uh, buying now things like silk, um, spices like pepper, directly at the source. Uh, and what, this was very important because no longer uh, did all of these European merchants have to go through, for instance, Muslim intermediaries. Um, and uh, these, these Muslim merchants, of course, would jack up the price before things arrived back in Western Europe. Uh, so it meant that, in fact, Western Europeans could get a lot more of these goods uh, and then bring them back to Western Europe with them. Um, and uh, we really see then the Portuguese beginning to set up all sorts of ports uh, throughout India. Uh, but uh, the game would not remain theirs uh, for very long, or do, they would not be the, uh, the sole Western Europeans. And uh, we see uh, very quickly uh, both uh, the English uh, and then also the Dutch uh, beginning to follow the Portuguese into India. And in fact, they end up becoming uh, even more successful uh, trading there, uh, in part because uh, both the English and the Dutch uh, sailed in, uh, uh, in ships that were faster, 
Um, that they were cheaper, they were more powerful. As they begin to do this, um, the English and the Dutch organized what are known as joint stock companies. Um, the sailing this far from Western Europe uh, meant that uh, there were really great risks that any individual investor would take. And so, in fact, investors now begin to bond together uh, to share uh, both the risk and then, if everything went well, to share the profits uh, from these various journeys that people were taking. And in fact, uh, when all went well, the profits could be considerable. Certain people had financial windfalls uh, from this trading. And so we really think to some degree what we're beginning to see here uh, are um, uh, the, the, the roots of a, uh, a global trading system beginning to, uh, to grow up. No account of new contacts uh, in this period we're discussing is complete uh, without at least some reference uh, to this man here. Uh, you probably know his face. This is Christopher Columbus. Uh, Columbus uh, was a, a sailor from Genoa, so an Italian city, a uh, maritime city that had had a long tradition of trade. Uh, and uh, it was Columbus who began to say very simply, um, why don't we, rather than attempting to travel to the east uh, to get to, uh, uh, to India, to Asia, why don't we travel to the west? Um, and uh, in effect, um, he felt that uh, this would be um, this would be the most direct path to do it. Um, there were two major problems with the uh, uh, with the calculations that Columbus had made. Uh, first of all, um, he actually thought the world was quite a bit smaller than it actually is, and so. Um, he really would have had to have sailed a lot longer than he thought initially. Uh, second of all, though, and really more importantly uh, for what would come afterwards, uh, Columbus had no idea that he was about to run into the Americas uh, at this point. Um, the uh, No one in Italy would fund uh, Columbus's expeditions, and so he ends up actually going uh, to the Spanish crown and asked them to fund his expedition. And they did it probably in part because they wanted now to compete uh, with Portugal. Um, Columbus himself lands in the Bahamas. Uh, initially, he uh, thinks uh, that uh, the natives are Indians from India, which is why he refers to them as Indians, mistakenly. And we uh, see that Columbus then will will begin to sail around the Caribbean. In three more voyages that Columbus would take around uh, the Atlantic, across the Atlantic rather, um, he never ended up finding gold, which he had promised, and he never actually finds Asia either. Um, and so <laughs> for some at least, uh, this was a bit of a disappointment. Uh, however, what of course he did find was far more valuable than either one of these. Um, we, um, news of his voyages begins to spread like wildfire around Western Europe. And in fact, uh, hundreds of other sailors from Spain, but also ones from England, France, and of the Netherlands will follow. Uh, and, uh, the people at the time in Western Europe begin to recognize, uh, that, uh, the American continent islands held all kinds of new opportunities for businessmen. Uh, in addition, of course, uh, to opportunities for conquest and settlement. What you begin to see in the wake of Columbus's expeditions uh, were a new series of global exchanges, sometimes referred to as the Columbian Exchange. So. Um, the exchange that occurs after uh, Columbus. Uh, and um, what this is going to constitute are all sorts of new links between uh, the lands and peoples of the world, and really an, an unprecedented volume of exchange across societies and cultures. Um, some of these 
Uh, and really the ones that are most negative and most reported on are the kind of biological exchanges that take place uh, between uh, what we might refer to as the old world and the new world. Uh, and uh, in effect, um, these, these kind of biological exchanges uh, really hit the people of the Americas extremely hard. Um, and uh, really these, um, we're going to see as a result uh, of um, these sort of infectious contagious diseases, um, Native American peoples in the Americas are going to suffer huge demographic losses. The worst scourge among diseases uh, was smallpox, but also diseases like uh, measles and influenza are also going to kill a lot of Native Americans. Uh, and uh, the reason uh, why this occurs is because um, before these voyages of, um, of exploration, uh, none of these diseases had actually reached the Western Hemisphere. Uh, so there were no inherited uh, or acquired immunities to them in the Americas. Uh, and uh, so uh, really uh, most of the people um, from the so-called old world were already immune to these diseases. Not so with Native Americans. Uh, and uh, really, um, these epidemics, uh, these really ferocious epidemics, uh, would destroy entire societies. Uh, so, for instance, um, um, they would ravage the Aztec uh, Empire um, and also uh, the Incan Empire, uh, both of which we've discussed. Um, the disease is going in the opposite direction. Uh, really um, did not do uh, anywhere near the damage in Western Europe. Uh, one disease that at least appears to have come uh, back to Western Europe from the Americas, for instance, uh, was syphilis. Uh, but again, it was really nowhere near the killer uh, that these diseases I've just discussed. To some degree, really, um, the, the diseases that hit the Americas do most of the job of conquest uh, because it left such weakened societies in their wake. Uh, but there is also a military aspect uh, to the conquest of the New World. And um, really uh, emblematic of this is um, the people we know as the conquistadores um, the, the, from Spain, a term that simply means conquerors. Uh, and in fact, um, a series of uh, these sort of generals will go out uh, to then militarily impose their will on indigenous peoples. And uh, uh, they were able to do so very effectively then with the kind of weapons, the guns that they had at their disposal, uh, and then um, the horses they had. Uh, the native people didn't have horses either. Uh, and uh, really, again, we're talking about lots of carnage in their path, the combination then of uh, disease and uh, killing. Now, uh, probably around 100 million people die in all. I don't want you to think, though, that um, the Columbian Exchange is simply one uh, of, uh, of death at a huge scale. And there really ends up uh, being a more positive aspect to their, this exchange, even if it was not apparent at first. Uh, and uh, this also, uh, this take, we can begin to see uh, the exchange of all sorts of goods that go back and forth between the old and the new world. Uh, so, for instance, uh, from Europe to the Americas, uh, things like, for instance, uh, wheat, uh, vines, um, certain animals like horse, uh, domestic animals like cattle, pig, sheep, uh, goats, chicken. People begin uh, to discover that wheat grows well in North America. Uh, and, of course, cattle can graze on its grasses. Um, from the Americas um, uh, to uh, the, uh, the Old World, uh, we begin to see things like, for instance, uh, corn, uh, potatoes. Um, the potato didn't exist in Ireland, for instance, before this point. But now, all of a sudden, uh, of course, it would become important there and elsewhere in Western Europe. Uh, things like beans, uh, tomatoes, peppers. Uh, peanuts uh, and uh, tobacco, of course, becomes a big seller. All of these things will travel uh, from the Americas then uh, to the old world. Uh, and uh, uh, really, we'll end up adding all sorts of new vitamins and also flavor 
uh, to the food of the old world. Ultimately, too, um, although um, it would not have been a apparent after the, uh, the initial demographic shock, um, there actually is going to end up being a population growth for the world on the overall uh, after the dust has cleared. Uh, so, for instance, around the year 1500, uh, there are going to be around 425 million people alive, uh, whereas um, around the year 1700, there are going to be around 610 million people alive on, on Earth. In the wake of um, all of this exploration and trade, too, um, there is also going to be a huge amount of new migration. Um, some of this um, is voluntary. Um, there are many Europeans, in some cases those of low social classes, uh, that decided that uh, it was best to go to the Americas uh, to be able to uh, to find new economic uh, or social opportunities. Uh, and so in some cases, uh, people will just pick off and go. Um, there also is going to, of course, be a large amount of forced migration uh, and, and a large number of the people who are going to be traveling then from the old world to the new world are enslaved people, usually from Africa. Uh, and uh, really, uh, they're going to begin to, um, the, the Western Europeans are going to end up setting up large plantations uh, in both South America and North America. Um, and uh, really, um, um, the, the Euro Western Europeans probably uh, would have been perfectly happy uh, to, uh, to exploit most of the Native Americans, uh, but of course, so many of them had died. Uh, so this is the reason why then um, they uh, begin desperately to search around for a new source of labor. And of course, labor that uh, could be owned. Uh, and so, in effect, um, both of uh, the people from Western European, U Europeans who were merchants or, again, just uh, colonizers and slaves begin then uh, to settle in to many of these territories that had been depopulated by disease. Altogether, um, what we're going to see because of these new contacts, and especially these ones uh, going between the old and the new world, uh, is a striking change in world history, uh, and one in which, um, to some degree, we're still feeling the repercussions of today. Um, and uh, really, um, we're not talking about it much in this course, but um, if I were just to, to speak to this a little bit, I would say that um, the one huge change that will occur is that now, as opposed to all the rest of world civilization we studied earlier, one culture Western European culture is going to begin to dominate the world as no single civilization has done previously. Um, Europeans are going to begin to spread out over the whole globe and begin to dominate it in many ways. Uh, and European models of things like, for instance, uh, politics, law, religion, art, are going to become found uh, nearly everywhere you go. Uh, and so, in essence, places like, for instance, North and South America uh, are, uh, culturally speaking, uh, going to become uh, highly influenced by Europe. Um, and the United States, of course, um, via the, the uh, American colonies, uh, the English colonies, are going to be heirs to the traditions of Europe. And uh, in fact, Western Europe is going to become so dominant that even in places without colonization by Europeans, uh, so most places in Africa and India, are still going to be deeply influenced uh, by European models of life. And uh, we can really uh, still feel this uh, on a uh, personal level, even if we don't think about it much. Uh, this is the reason, for instance, uh, that in the United States, we are now speaking English, not because English is any better than any other language, uh, but of course, uh, the English are going to be uh, some of the, the most successful colonial powers. 
and so they uh, end up bringing their language with them. Uh, this is why, for instance, Spanish is one of the dominant world languages. Um, there was really a point when Spanish was a teeny little minority language uh, spoken by a, a small number of people uh, in the northern part of Spain, when most of Spain was under Muslim domination. Uh, and one of the reasons why Spanish it really um, is as an archaic form of, uh, it really has developed far less than many other Romance languages, it's closer to um, Latin. However, during this period of time, the Spanish would again be very successful in uh, conquest and colonization. And so, of course, they end up bringing their language with them. Uh, this is also, of course, uh, why uh, the Catholic faith, uh, spread by many of uh, these, these uh, uh, people who come and explore uh, and take new territory in the new world, uh, is going to spread so far. Uh, this is why, of course, uh, Benedictine monasticism, uh, which really, again, starts at one teeny little monastery in Italy, is going to uh, spread throughout uh, the new world, uh, since it already spread throughout the old world. Uh, and uh, this, of course, uh, is also the reason uh, why um, you are not at, only at a Benedictine school, but also at a liberal arts college. Um, the liberal arts college uh, was really just one way to, uh, to organize knowledge and the teaching of it. And uh, this was a model, of course, that was dominant in Western Europe in the Middle Ages. Uh, and uh, this is, of course, was a model uh, that really held as its ideal that an educated person should not uh, just learn a bunch of material, uh, but they should also um, learn how to think. Uh, and that the same sort of skills of uh, being able to uh, uh, being able to, for instance, uh, debate knowledge, uh, being able to uh, to puzzle out difficult questions. I love that these habits of minds would then translate into other activities. Uh, and uh, that is still an ideal, of course, uh, that all people who are liberal art, arts colleges hold, and is one specifically uh, that we have held at Benedictine. That's one I hope that, uh, again, you still prize. And uh, since I cannot make uh, this any closer to experience than I already have, uh, with that, I will close. Uh, thank you for your attention.